So I come home from work and one of the first things I have to do is I have to use the bathroom. And so I come in the door and then this happened to me. This is kind of gross, but it's true. A lizard in the toilet, get out of there. Oh no. So before I use the bathroom, looks like I have a little chore to do. Looks like I need to get out my welding gloves. So I'm a little freaked out about this. I've got my welding gloves. He's actually really pretty. You can't tell on the camera, but he's got little flakes of purple and green in him. Ah! I just gotta do this quickly! Oh no! He went inside! I missed him. He went down into the toilet. Good morning, it's raining, but um, I want to show you guys it really is raining. This banana tree that just fell last night, take a look. Uh, those aren't big enough. I think this tree needs to come down, because if I take that tree down then I'll have a whole bunch of banana fruit, and I'd rather banana fruit. Okay, so I just went and I bought some chili dulce, which is red peppers and savoya onions. And some farmer friends of mine actually saw me on the street and they had a whole truck full of lemons or limes, lemons. So they gave me a huge bag for free. So I'm super excited about that and I might as well use it up with this. I do have these, which I want to try out. These bananas, they're tiny, but I did see, and what a lot of Costa Ricans do, what we do down here. Um, I did see an empty lot over there that have papayas, green papayas. So I'm going to go get those. So. Okay, so I have my little tool for getting fruit and I have my basket. And I'm looking for this lot that's this empty lot that has these wonderful papayas that I can eat. They like the food that we work for. Okay, so here it is. Look at it. Well, those look good, don't they? Let's hope I can get through this grass. Thank goodness it's not too tall. Let's see if it'll reach. Wow, look what I got. Three big ones. I have my bananas and I got, oh, four. Four and one small one. Nice. Look at this sticky juice that's on there. Okay. So that was a good morning, but I have to get ready to go for work. A green papaya picadillo, and I can make a green banana ceviche. So I'll do that when I get home from work. So I never did see that lizard again. He went down the hole and was never seen again. It's not the first time it's happened to me, and it won't be the last, but it was the smallest lizard. I kind of feel bad for him, because the other two bigger lizards I got out, and that guy, I mean, I had to flush the toilet. He went down and then I had to go. And he never came back up again. So, poor thing. But, so that's what happened with the lizard. So I'm going to make today a wonderful ceviche. Look at the limes, there's two different colors. Aren't they lovely? Lemons and limes. I think these are a hybrid. Um, between a mandarin and a lime mm, and they're just delicious. So I also have green bananas that I picked from my banana tree that's growing in shade and it wasn't doing very well. It kind of fell over and it had all these green bananas on. So I cut them all up and put them in some water here so they wouldn't get too brown. So I'm going to boil that and I'm going to make a green banana ceviche. Mm. 
The papaya that I picked the other day from the lot across the street there, I'm going to make these probably tomorrow. And I'm going to make a um, green papaya picadillo. I think that's how you pronounce it. So there's been a lot going on since my last video. Um, I think it was the one that I went to San Jose. It's October, so I should hear from Sandra this month about my immigration papers, which I'm super excited about. Actually, last night I was doing some drawings, sort of the same way that I was doing drawings for this house, um, for a house right there. So it was really inspiring to come up with some ideas. Um, tell me what you think. So this is my little rendering in Google SketchUp, a free program that I love using. And that other side was my house, and this side here is the side that I would, would like to see a little house built on for a friend of mine. She's requested that she wants her massage studio downstairs with a little bathroom attached and she has a car so there has to be parking. And upstairs she wants to have the kitchen and the bedroom. So I've just sort of created the, the downstairs area, just looking at some ideas. So here I have the massage room and the bathroom, a little sort of corridor, walkway along the side, and all downstairs is open, and then the stairs will go up to her enclosed living space upstairs. I do believe that I have the house now because I first envisioned it in Google SketchUp. I really think that you have to place something intensely in your mind's eye before you can have any real fruition of it. I imagine this house, every square inch of this house in Google SketchUp before I had any of the resources to build it. Those are floating components. And this is the second idea. It's very similar. It's just a lot of a smaller building space and much more green area for her little three doggies to run around. Um, the studio is smaller. The bathroom is smaller. Um, the stairs still go over top of the car. So anyways, I haven't spoken to her yet, but we will look at it and she will come up with more ideas. It's just certainly fun to do. I would have enjoyed being an architect. So remember the little foster dog that had the cone on her head that was staying here? Well, she's still here. We haven't found adoption, but remember I was saying that it was kind of ridiculous that they had fixed her and then they didn't tattoo or there was no marking. There was a scar. It looked like she was fixed, but they, I guess, second-guessed themselves and they cut her open again and searched inside her and didn't find any lady parts and stitched her up again. Well, this surgery was done uh, right after she went through an Arlechia treatment. And Arlechia is a disease that dogs get from mosquitoes, but it's a very popular disease here for dogs, and I know many, many dogs who have died of Arlechia. It's very common. So anyways, they need a, like a month and a half treatment, pills twice a day. And so we went through the treatment, and she was fine. We didn't do a blood work. They fixed her when she came back from being fixed when she didn't need to be. She got really sick again. She was having trouble breathing. At night she was panting. She was standing. She was completely uneasy. So anyways, they took her back to the vet and turns out she has our leaky again. So we have to go through another month and a half of pills twice a day. So that's what's going on with little Alba. I also found a great place for my grandmother to stay and I'm really excited for her visit. She's only here for four days and she's quite elderly and I've never had an adult, well, an adult, I've never had a conversation with her. Um, but when I was a kid growing up and even to this day through my adulthood, if anybody asked me who my hero is, I would kind of say it's her because I know she, her in real life um, and I know her accomplishments. I don't like know her personally, but her accomplishments are amazing. Um, so I admire a woman that has done so much in her life. Anyways, she's here for four days. I'm super excited and nervous and I have lots of anticipation about it. 
It's only like a month away, so I'm really excited about that. I'd like to talk actually more about my situation regarding my feelings on that, but I'm going to save that for another day because it's heavy. So while the ceviche is marinating, I thought I would take this time to answer a question that Random Insights left me. Scott is his name. And he writes, in searching out my ultimate destination, I guess I'd like to know how you chose yours. Did you have any connections there before you moved? Did you try some different parts of Costa Rica before you settled on where you are now? And how difficult was it to secure a place to live and a job when you first arrived? Thanks again for your willingness to help. Well, I'd like to help. I'd like to be of help. Um, but my story, of course, would be very different than anyone else's story. But I'm happy to tell you my story. I moved here, I don't know, like 17 years ago. No, hasn't been that long. It's been a long time, 12, 13 years ago. And, um... I had a lot of experience with this place before I moved. Uh, my first time I came, I was 17 years old, and it was on March break, and I came with some girlfriends of mine, and it was very exciting, and it was the most beautiful, most tropical place I had ever been. Um, another reason why, well, the main reason why I came here is because my friend from high school, her mom sold her place, which was kind of like a place that some of us would hang out sometimes. Um, she sold her house and she moved to the beach in Costa Rica in Jaco here. So that March break a bunch of us decided to go visit Jen's mother and we all went down as a group and we stayed there. She had two cabinas in the back that we uh, rented and it was lovely. So um, because it was such a great experience I literally never missed a year. From when I was 17, I came back the following year, and the following year, I came back every single year. Whenever I had a holiday, I would come. The other thing was that Costa Rica was a really cheap destination. My flights, when I first started coming here, were like $350 tax included. So that was the normal going price. The airport was outdoors. You used to walk off the airplane like in the movies and the air, the Costa Rican air would hit you. This moist, beautiful, damp, caught, gorgeous air. And I fell in love. And every subsequent year that I came, I would always come to Hako because um, I had friends here, I met people here. It was a very small town back then, and if you're a, a gringo, if you were not from here, everyone would know right away. People were wonderful, very gracious, very interested to be friendly with you. Costa Ricans are wonderful, friendly, beautiful people. Um, yes, it's changed. Hako has definitely changed. And if I was to come to Hako now, without all my past knowledge and experience and memories and history, I probably wouldn't have chosen Hako. Um, just an hour ago, a friend came to my door and he actually broke down in tears um, talking about remembering three, four years ago when he was mugged and having a conversation with another friend of his, a Costa Rican that hadn't, he hadn't seen in a while and they had a really nice bond together and um, the guy got jumped like a block away from my house and stabbed a whole bunch of times and um, because there's actually video cameras all around downtown now, they caught the group that did this to him, which is remarkable. Um, but anyways, on the lighter side of things. Um, so that's why I came to Hako, because uh, I, and I kept coming back because it was familiar with me. And I had a job that I used to do a lot of traveling. So I was always on the go. I was living out of suitcases all the time. And I was going to different cities all the time, cities. And it was an adventure, and it was metropolitan, and it was hard work. So on my vacations, I didn't want to adventure. I wanted to go to a place where I knew that the weather was going to be perfect, and I had friendly f faces around me, and I could totally relax. And I knew knew what to expect. I enjoyed um, because seems like my life is always an adventure. Like there's not really, you know, people say to me, oh, there's no security with anything, Lilania. But really feel like since I was a child that I've tried to work towards some sort of security in my life, which 
that's happened to a certain extent. Um, in any event, it's something that I, I like the familiarity of security, and so that's why I would always come back here. So when I, I, I moved here, actually, when I was, t I stayed here for about a year when I was 27 years old. I lived here for a year on the beach, and then again I moved here when I was 35, so that was a while ago. Was I 35 or 34? It might have been 34, actually. Anyways. Um, what were your other questions here? Uh, how did you choose? Did you have connections? Yes. And I didn't try any other parts of Costa Rica, as I said. I mean, I, I've toured around. I've seen some other parts. I've taken bus rides. The bus is very, very convenient here. I have uh, a, a very good friend from childhood who lives in Pavones who teaches yoga. She's amazing. Shooting star. Yoga studios. Amy Koo. She's awesome. And uh, I love it here. I love that I can grow food. I love the weather. I love to be half naked all the time. I love the ocean, although I don't get to it as much now that I'm not living directly on the beach. I love that I can own dogs. I love that, um, I love the rain. The rain is lovely. It just feels romantic all the time to me. Um, and now, the realistic things, work and finding a place. Costa Ricans down here, I'm talking about the Jaco area, like from Capos, this, on this coast, in the Guanacaste area. You know, on the other side of the highway that can, that can rent a place for $75, that's a very, very simple room that's not modern. Basic PVC plumbing. It might not even have a real shower head. And then you can get a condo on the beach that'll run you, you know, a thousand dollars a night. Most of the rent here for regular, you know, working people could be about five hundred dollars a month. Um, but you can find deals, definitely like three fifty and stuff like that. And work. I'm still waiting for my residency. As I've said before, you have to leave every three months for 72 hours to renew your visa to stay here in this country. You're not legally allowed to work here unless you have uh, your residency and then you can work. Um, so that's why I've been waiting tooth and nail for my residency to come. I've been waiting too long. I think as far as work, and sort of like anywhere, you don't want to really work for somebody else. If labor is really cheap down here, which people are going to want to pay those low labor expenses for uh, running a business so that, and building and anything. But if you want to make money, there's definitely room for entrepreneurship. If you have a business idea or a skill, definitely that can be sold down here. And community, I think it's really important to have a, a community here, to have some people here that you can count on. Although the Costa Rican people are very nice and, it's, and it can be easy to make friends with them, I think that it's important if you're going to move here to, to at least before you commit to being, and like anywhere else, if it's before you commit to being somewhere, that you have some sort of a base and some sort of like a, a community that you feel that you could make it your home. So, um, I know a lot of gringos come down here with money, and really money is their community, so they don't have to formulate and work on relationships with a give and take. They come with money and they take whatever they can buy. That's basically how it works with money. So um, that's, again, a whole different way of moving down here. Um, it's probably the safest and most conservative and most secure way of moving down here is to come with a pile of money. And really, you'd be looking at retirement and sort of being keeping yourself active. But if you're you know, trying to come here to make money, even if you create your own business that's successful, it's very hard to actually make money um, in this Hako area. It seems as if the idea of moving here, a lot of newcomers are very different than the old timers. Um, because the old timers have seen the newcomers come and go. And the newcomers come and they come with bright ideas and uh, big hopes and um, Vrabado 
and egos that will tell you that they know it, they've done it, they've experienced it all uh, in the States and they're successful. So it should be able to transfer here. And in many cases it just doesn't. So um, for me it's painful. I usually don't make friends that are newbies here because I don't want to go through all that crap and I don't want to have to tell them the things that might happen to them and then watch them go through these things that I've just told them. Like you really, ha it, unfortunately in life you have to experience things for yourself. Um, and if you have been living in the States for 50 years and life has been successful and you come here and you think that's transferable, um, in some cases it can be but in a lot of cases that I've seen it's disastrous if you want to hear any of these disastrous stories I got stories to tell and again they lead into in many cases forms of prostitution topics of poverty and a worldwide economic system but I look at things a little too broadly and feminism and all these things that are trending it seems as if back home uh, they have no basis to talk about these things, but in a place that's really macho and very religious, wow, it just blows my mind since I'm like a YouTuber. Well, I'm not a YouTuber, I just pay attention to what's happening on YouTube. So, I think I've answered all the questions. Oh no. Why did I actually move here? Um, it, uh, why did I move here? Okay, so I was 35 years old and I was a career woman uh, in Toronto and I thought that a way to successful living would be to work really hard because no man that believes in equality, a wonderful man that would, that would find a great partnership with me, would believe in creativity and being progressive, and I thought definitely a successful man is looking for a successful woman. So um, I woke up at 35 years old in Toronto and thought like I've never really dated. I don't, there's nothing on the horizon and I'm not attracted to metrosexual men. And in the fashion industry, which is what I was in, I was meeting no men burly men, 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 men. I don't know, it was just probably that I was not going to meet them in my kitchen and I was not going to meet them in my work environment. And probably I had this aura about me, um, busy body, working women, no time for that. Men are a dime a dozen. But when I was 35, I was like, I guess the clock was ticking, kind of, and I'm like, I don't want to be alone my whole life. And I, on one of my trips down here, I met an American man, and he called me every day and told me he loved me, and I thought this was it. And, of course, he would love me. Why wouldn't he love me? I have money and career and looks and health, and I'm a dancer, and I'm in fashion, and, uh, you know, we're going to have a great life together. I've worked so hard to get to this point. And he was a surfer. And after, like, um, I made big plans for a year to, you know, sell all my antiques. I had a beautiful apartment, you know, things, my car, my job. Just took me a year to, to let it all go uh, over the course of the year of us communicating and I said I love Hako. I, I, it's my place. It's, I love it. So, so yes, I want to live there with you and, and be in love and maybe have children one day and start a new life. I had been a career woman for, you know, 15 years. I felt probably burnt out from all the traveling and stuff. So, yeah, after four months of me moving here, he was, like, having sex with other girls. And he told all the other girls living in the area down by the beach that all these things about me that were not attractive things. So I was finding it really hard to make girlfriends. I would say to him, oh, I met a girl that, you know, she's Canadian girl, and, and I think that we can be friends. And he'd be all awkward, and then the next time I'd see her, she'd be all awkward. And turns out that they're, like, you know, involved. So it seemed like 
every single time I make a girlfriend there was this weird thing. Anyways, I found I spent just a whole lot of time alone in the same way that I spent a whole lot of time alone in Toronto. So, um, it was like those patterns that I wanted to change, that I made huge physical and mental changes to invite togetherness and family and love and sharing in my life. Um, those patterns followed me. And I think that that's indicative for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people that are down here moved here to get away from something because they were unsatisfied with wherever they came from in some way and they think they're going to be happier when they come here. And the fact is, I think in most cases, in most cases, not in all cases, because sometimes if you change your environment, everything can change. Um, it's your mindset too. But also, we're terribly ingrained humans and often patterns in life will follow us. Um, so, I'm, you know, I've been here all this long and I'm still in love with the place that I've always been in love with and I'm still experiencing life and all these amazing things alone and I think I could have, you know, all those years working, it was very glamorous and with the technology now and if I was a millennial, um, I'd probably be like Facebooking the whole time and tweeting everything and um, I'd have a channel about my fashion and all my travels but the reality was I couldn't share any of that. There was no smartphones back then so it was very glamorous but it was lonely. Um, and now in a way, in a raw, organic, um, more mature way, this is also glamorous for me. I mean, I'm not talking about ultimate, but people live on the mountain, and everyone, I, most of the women that I know down here, you know, with husbands, have a much more luxurious lifestyle than I. But I could never own this size lot and build this house in Toronto. I'd have to be a multi-millionaire to be able to achieve something like that, and I was able to do it here, so. These are the reasons why I moved here. I've done lots of different things, real estate, except I couldn't lie to the people. And the kinds of people that were coming to buy real estate had gotten a blow job last night. Now they're all, oh, I want to move here. Um, yeah, I, you know, the, that, you know, guys with like the Trump vocabulary. I'm just like, oh my God, I can't deal. Um, so I couldn't do that for very long, and I did do organic food, vegan food, um, catered that, and I was looking for a partner, so I was looking for a partner, couldn't find one, but I had quite a few clients, and it would have been great if I didn't feel like I was just working myself off my butt, doing all the shopping, and all the delivering, and all the preparation, and all the cleaning, and everything out of my house, it was a little like a little, mm. But if I, I could create an actual commercial kitchen here if I had another person with a similar vision. And the woman that wants to buy this little piece of property, just like a quarter of my property here and build a little house, her husband enjoys cooking as well. So maybe we could do on Sundays on the rooftop instead of you know, dance classes, have a little comida and I could move the carport on this side when they build their house and that could be also a little part that you could sit under if you get food to take out. Anyways, these are all ideas. Um, so that's where I'm at today. I'm going to go eat my ceviche now. So I will talk to you later and if you have any questions, just ask. Thanks, bye. Oh, and I have one more thing that I want to tell you guys because I mentioned it earlier, something about my grandmother. You probably have no place to put that. So I just wanted to tell you the amazing things that make me think that this woman is a, my hero. Okay, and I don't think that these things are possible in the current year. Here we go. You tell me, do you guys think that this is possible in the current year? Woman, born like a hundred years ago, married the second boyfriend she ever had, her first boyfriend in college, got a PhD and master's in linguistics, a PhD and master's in accounting, was the head of the United Church of Canada, was the head controller 
of Canada's largest corporation. She had 500 accountants working under her. This is a public company, the largest Canadian public company. She was the head controller. This woman had seven children. They're all healthy and happy and productive. Same husband, like 70 years. Oh, and she speaks five languages fluently. Spanish, English, French, German, and Portuguese fluently. She's a healthy woman and has full mental capability at like almost a hundred years old. Her first husband that she met in college is my grandfather and he died uh, about eight years back and when he died after 70 years of marriage she got in her Westphalia by herself and drove up to northern Quebec and lived in a community of native and lived there for a month amongst them and only spoke French. After that month she got back in her Westphalia and drove back to Ontario and got on an airplane and went to Cuba for a month and lived in rural, a rural area in Cuba uh, with a family and spoke only Spanish. So that's what my grandmother did when grandpa died uh, for the first two months after he died. This is how she... She's a very pragmatic and methodical woman. She's not, as I know, um, an emotional person. Um, she's a doer, obviously. Look at all the things that she did in her life. Anyways, I'm super impressed by what she's done. I don't know who she is, um, but I th have a feeling that a lot of who she is is what she's done because I think she's rigidly pragmatic and methodical, even with emotional matters. So, I'm impressed. I'm more emotional than her. Anyways, now I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs>